This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Ring. Gollum was disappointed once more, and now he was getting angry, and also tired of the game. It had made him very hungry indeed. This time, he did not go back to the boat. He sat down in the dark by Bilbo. That made the hobbit most dreadfully uncomfortable and scattered his wits. It's got to ask us a question, my precious. Yes, yes, yes. Just one more question to guess. Yes, yes, said Gollum. But Bilbo simply could not think of any question with that nasty, wet, cold thing sitting next to him and pawing and poking him. He scratched himself. He pinched himself. Still, he could not think of anything. Ask us, ask us, said Gollum. Bilbo pinched himself and slapped himself. He gripped on his little sword. He even felt in his pocket with his other hand. There he found the ring he had picked up in the passage and forgotten about. What have I got in my pocket? he said aloud. He was talking to himself, but Gollum thought it was a riddle, and he was frightfully upset. Not fair, not fair, he hissed. It isn't fair, my precious, is it, to ask us what it's got in its nasty little pocketses? Bilbo, seeing what had happened, and having nothing better to ask, stuck to his question. What have I got in my pocket? he said louder. <sighs> hissed Gollum. It must give us three guesses, my precious. Three guesses. Very well. Guess away, said Bilbo. Over the last few weeks, we here at the Word of the Week have considered some big, big questions, like what is the cosmos, and where do genies come from, and why an ash tree? But gaming and the pop culture world that is adjacent to gaming isn't always about the big, big questions. Sometimes it's about tiny little questions, questions like, what have I got in my pockets? Of course, that turned out to be a very big question in John Ronald Rule Tolkien's The Hobbit, or There and Back Again, written in 1937. That question saved The Hobbit, Bilbo Baggins' life, and as a consequence, turned the life of his nephew Frodo Baggins upside down. Ultimately, that question cost the impish Gollum his life and cost Frodo his ring finger. But the thing was, it wasn't a fair question. Bilbo admitted as much, that it was technically a breach of the rules of the sacred riddle game. But it is a fair question at the game table. After all, adventurers' pockets are filled with lots of weird junk. And how much do we really know about the stuff on that equipment list? What are iron rations? What's a signet ring? What's block and tackle? What's in a navigator's kit? So, we're going to leave our cosmic questions behind and move from the biggest of big to the smallest of small. We're going to talk about the mundane junk that adventurers line their pockets with. And we're going to start with a discussion of what Bilbo had in his pockets. Actually, we're going to start with a discussion of a cartoonist, a magazine, a legal battle, and a massive misunderstanding. And then we'll talk about what Bilbo had in his nasty little pocketses. We've brought up Dragon Magazine before. It replaced the Strategic Review as TSR Incorporated's official magazine for role-playing games, including D&D, in 1976, along with its sister publication, Dungeon. One of our fondest memories from that magazine was a little comic strip that adorned the last page every month from 1980 through 1983, and then again in the Trading Card Magazine Duelist in 1990, and then again in Dragon from 1999 to 2003. It was a little comic called What's New with Phil and Dixie, 
and it was a goofy, punny, fourth-wall-breaking, self-aware satirization of the world of RPGs, starring Phil Foglio's author insertion, Phil Foglio, and his companion Dixie Null. The relationship between Phil and Dixie was complicated. They seemed to be friends, business associates, and occasional lovers. Now, we're not generally romantic sorts here at the Word of the Week, but we can't help but share a little side note. Phil was asked many times if Dixie was based on a real person, and he had many goofball answers, none of which were true, because the truth was she wasn't. Until in 1990, Foglio met Kaya Murphy and married her. And Phil said in the introduction of one of the What's New collections that he had never stopped looking for the real person that embodied all of the characteristics he'd imbued Dixie with. And, Foglio said, when, much to my astonishment, I finally found her, I married her. But sappiness aside, we bring this up for a couple of reasons. First of all, we're huge fans of Phil Foglio's work, including the steampunk fantasy comic Girl Genius, which you should absolutely check out. And because we're fans of his graphic novel adaptations of the absolutely wonderful Myth Adventures of Oz and Skeev by the sadly late Robert Lynn Asprin. But second of all, we bring this up because of one panel in one terribly misunderstood episode of What's New. It was, in point of fact, the last episode of the first run of What's New, and it was meant as a goodbye from Phil to his fans. Foglio had decided to move on to other projects. The split up with TSR was entirely amicable, but he drew a farewell comic which implied that he'd been fired by TSR over a long-running gag. See, Phil and Dixie were very adult, especially Dixie and they were constantly teasing an episode called Sex in D&D, especially Dixie. And whenever they brought it up, something in the strip would prevent them from doing the strip, which made them mad, especially Dixie. So in the final episode, Phil and Dixie traveled to TSR's corporate office, met with editor Kim Mohan, and the couple demanded they be allowed to do their Sex in D&D strip, especially Dixie. And the final panel shows them sitting outside the office with a pink slip. And for years afterward, Phil Foglio had to explain that no, he hadn't really been fired. It was all just a joke to provide closure for the sex and D&D gag. But in that strip, there's a single panel in which Phil and Dixie visit the TSR legal department. And the folks are all suspiciously avoiding using a certain word. One woman shows off her engagement circular metal band. A man is talking about how some kids were playing circular metal band around the rosy. And one woman yells at someone to answer the phone because it's circular metal banding. Phil delivers the punchline. Are you still having trouble with the Tolkien estate? As funny as it is, this panel refers to a real-life event. TSR was threatened with lawsuits by the estate of one J.R.R. Tolkien for infringing on his intellectual property. But it wasn't about circular metal bands, which was, of course, what Bilbo had in his pocket. It was actually about Bilbo. Specifically, it was about hobbits. See, Tolkien used a lot of European mythology in his books, so his estate couldn't stake a claim on most of the fantasy elements but there were some pretty unique things that the folks at TSR decided to change to avoid any legal problems. If you're wondering why hobbits are halflings, why ents are treants, or why the Balrog is the Balor, you have your answer. In some future episode, we're probably going to explore the history of the halfling, the hobbit, and the kinder. But one thing they couldn't claim was rings. See, rings, we're talking about jewelry here, rings are pretty much the oldest and most popular form of jewelry. Even in ancient times, people wore rings cut from single stones. Ancient rings made of jet and stone have been found across Europe. Romans cut rings from amber and other materials. And obviously, once metalworking and gem cutting became things, rings became much more elaborate. Rings are so ubiquitous that there are literally only three major cultures on Earth that apparently didn't wear rings. 
Assyrian sculpture and portraiture is entirely devoid of ring jewelry. Although the Irish Celts had lots of jewelry, not one ring has been discovered by archaeologists among their otherwise impressive caches. And the Eskimos of North America don't wear rings, as Admiral Robert Perry discovered during his expeditions in the late 1880s. It was common for explorers to carry various trinkets and treasures with which to barter with native peoples, and Perry loaded up on rings, only to discover that the Eskimos had no interest in them. Because of the cold climate, even the slight tightness of a ring could restrict circulation and starve a finger of blood flow. But Tolkien didn't write about just any ring. He wrote about a magic ring. Surely that must have been pretty unique, right? Unfortunately, no. Historically speaking, rings are one of those things that just seem to have a lot of charm and mysticism around them. Many cultures have traditions about the power of rings. Romans believed turquoise rings could protect against illness. In China, jade rings had various powers depending on the color of the jade. And then there was the ring of Joan of Arc. Between the mid-1300s and the mid-1400s, France was caught up in the Hundred Years' War, though it wasn't a war the whole time. It was basically a big, complicated dispute over who was supposed to inherit the throne of France. By the time Joan of Arc was born, the current French king, Charles VI, was unfit to rule because, first, he was eleven at the time he took the throne, and second, he was mentally ill. So his four uncles argued over who was actually supposed to run France. There was an assassination, some ugliness, it all got complicated. And in the end, Henry V of England took advantage of the chaos to basically conquer most of France. And the French government was locked in turmoil, fighting over who the proper ruler of France was, the Duke of Burgundy or the Count of Armagnac. As a teenager, Joan of Arc claimed to have received divine visions, telling her to join the army, drive out the English, and support Charles VII as the rightful king. And she helped do all of those things. But she also got herself captured by supporters of the Duke of Burgundy, who turned her over to an English religious court. The court interrogated her about everything, from her virginity to her visions to her magical ring. Yes, her magical silver ring. They were basically trying to find any excuse to execute her as a heretic. And they did so. Eventually, the Catholic Church examined the charges against Joan of Arc, dismissed them as garbage, and pronounced her a martyr. Meanwhile, her silver ring was stuck in England and for 600 years, it stayed there. This year, however, 2016, a French amusement company finally managed to buy the ring at auction from a British historian for 425,000 US dollars and bring it home to France as a national treasure. But that ring wasn't really magical. Probably. And besides, Tolkien's ring wasn't just any ring. It was a magic ring that granted invisibility. That must have been unique, right? It's certainly not anything like, oh, say, the ring of Gyges. Plato, the Greek philosopher, was very fond of metaphors and thought experiments. He often used them to prove various philosophical points. In point of fact, the entire lost continent of Atlantis might just have started as an extended platonic metaphor. In his book, The Republic, Plato was trying to make a point about morality. He wanted to argue that morality had to be for its own sake. You couldn't just do the right thing out of fear of punishment. You had to do the right thing because it was right. And so, he referenced a mythical magical ring, the Ring of Gyges, that rendered the wearer invisible. With it, one could do anything without fear of getting caught. In the original myth, the finder of the ring used it to seduce women, murder the king, and gain power. Fine, so invisibility rings aren't unique to Tolkien. But the one ring to rule them all wasn't just an invisibility ring. It gave the wearer the power to rule the world. Surely that idea must have been unique to Tolkien. Surely that can't have some historical or mythological basis. 
It's the Rheingold Ring. Der Ring des Nibelungen, the Ring of the Nibelung, is a four-part super opera composed by Richard Wagner, and it was an opera unlike any opera that came before it. In fact, in a letter to his friends, Wagner refused to even call it an opera. He thought of it as a drama, modeled on the old Greek dramas. Like Oedipus, for example, the opera came in four parts, three tragedies and a satire. Of course, he wrote it as a three-part myth with a prequel. And the entire work was presented over four nights. It was over 14 hours of opera. The first part, the prequel, Das Rengeld, told the story of a Nibelung, a dwarf named Albrecht, who stole magical gold from river spirits of the Rhine River. Albrecht crafted a powerful magical ring with the aid of the gods. The ring could grant the wearer the power to rule the world, but it was also prophesied to destroy everyone who held it. The ring was the most desirable object in all the world. The rest of the ring cycle, as it's called, is told in three operas, The Valkyries, Siegfried, and The Twilight of the Gods. It tells of the conflicts created by the rings, of the complex relationships between mortals and the Norse gods, of great mortal heroes, and ultimately, of the destruction of the heavens and the gods. As prophesized, the Rheingold Ring truly does destroy everyone and everything it touches. It has also been suggested by some scholars that the entire story is about industry over spirituality and how the modern world destroys ancient faiths and spirits and threatens the natural world. Which is completely unlike any other trilogy plus a prequel based on European mythology about a magical golden ring that grants ultimate power but destroys everyone who touches it and which would take a ridiculous number of hours to watch in one go. But we're not suggesting Tolkien ripped off the ring cycle. The stories are very different, but we are saying that the Tolkien estate was lucky that they didn't have to worry about the Wagner estate the same way TSR had to worry about the Tolkien estate. But how can you use this in your game? Well, honestly, magic rings have always enjoyed a special place in D&D. They are higher level magical items. They are the powerful ones. In D&D 3.5, rings are the hardest and most expensive magical items to craft, requiring at least 12 experience levels. In D&D 4E, rings didn't even become available to PCs until 12th level. Rings are special. They are ancient symbols of magic and power and status. So be aware of that. But beyond that, note that the really powerful items have really good stories. The Ring of Gyges wasn't just any old ring of invisibility. The Rheingold Ring was forged by dwarves from stolen river spirit gold and cursed by the fates. Joan of Arc's Silver Ring was special because it belonged to a teenage war hero who was executed as a heretic for having visions and supporting the rightful heir to the throne. There's nothing wrong with plain magical items. It's okay to have a few simple things floating around. But the memorable ones, the ones that get four-part super epics, are the ones that have a great story. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.